Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Corumbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the very first of our very special year-end awards on the Three Martini Lunch along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Merry Christmas Eve to all our listeners. We hope you have a wonderful Christmas holiday with your uh, family and friends uh, tomorrow. The first set of our year-end awards begins with most overrated political figure. And there's obviously a lot of people we could throw on there. I'm going to go with one that is going to seem like an insult, and that is Chris Christie of New Jersey. Obviously, he's done a very solid job in New Jersey. He's tackled some very difficult issues, including debt and unions and that sort of thing. But his dominant victory in New Jersey this year, which was also very impressive and we're happy to see, he won by, what, 20 points or actually more than that, uh, against a Democrat in a very blue state. But immediately he was anointed as the messiah for the GOP, that uh, this debate over who should be the nominee is pretty much settled. He's uh, been successful twice in, in a blue state. And obviously, we've got a long way to go before 2016. We'll see what the rest of his record looks like. We'll see who else jumps in the race. But because he won by 20 plus points in New Jersey, I'm not sure qualifies him has to be the uh, inevitable standard bearer for the party in three years. That's a very solid choice there, Greg. I think it's safe to say that, look, his polling numbers changed very dramatically when he hugged Obama at the Jersey Shore right after Hurricane Sandy. That made a lot of Democrats feel warm and fuzzy about him, a lot of independents in New Jersey. And it just basically never faded from that. And that's what, you know, chased out Cory Booker and chased out most of the top tier competitors. Good for him, but the idea that that's going to catapult him to the Republican nomination in 2016 uh, is a pretty implausible scenario. Now, in terms of my most overrated figures, uh, Greg, I was really tempted to go with Egypt's Mohamed Morsi, because you think about it, in 2012, this was the future of Egyptian politics. And here we are a year later, and he is the past of Egyptian politics. Uh, One year in office before he alienated everyone, ran the country to the ground, and had a military coup against him. But I'm going to turn stateside, and I'm going to go with another familiar figure to the Three Martini Lunch. I'm going to go with departing New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg, um, and I'm picking him as being overrated as a political force. You may recall he lost uh, both of those Colorado recalls, throwing out two state legislators who had pushed through gun control laws. He spent uh, millions and millions in Virginia supporting Terry McAuliffe, who won, but he threw in the money when McAuliffe was already way ahead. So it really looked like, you know, trying to piggyback on a victory that was already in the bag. Then, of course, as we all know, Cuccinelli surged towards the end. So if anything, you could say it, it certainly didn't do any good for McAuliffe. I think it'd be, you can debate how much of a factor gun control was in the closing days of that race uh, versus Obamacare. Think about where we were when this year began. Uh, the Newtown shooting uh, massacre tragedy really did set the political environment for as for favorable for gun control uh, as much as we had seen in many, many years. You remember Joe Manchin going on Morning Joe the following morning and saying, you know, the political environment has changed and he was going to support uh, gun control. What came out of that was the Toomey Manchin proposal for background checks at gun shows, even though the Newtown shooter did not get his guns at a gun show and uh, did not pass the Senate. There was a backlash in Colorado, as mentioned, and there was really no discernible bump for the governors of the states where they did pass gun control, like Connecticut, New York, and Maryland. So Mike Bloomberg has an enormous amount of financial resources built from his publishing empire of Bloomberg News and things like that. And if it didn't have that, gun control would be basically where it was post Al Gore losing Tennessee and Arkansas in 2000, which is a, really a non-entity for much of the Bush years. So gun control you know, only is revitalized because a billionaire has decided to sink lots of money into it. And it's by and large not effective uh, either influencing lawmakers or in uh, influencing campaigns unless you have an enormous advantage to start with like Terry McAuliffe did. Yeah, I think a lot of people in and outside of New York City are tired of Michael Bloomberg deciding what's best for your life in terms of what size drinks you have, whether or not you're allowed to own firearms. Now he's on to mandatory flu vaccines, styrofoam bans, all this stuff. And uh, I don't think anybody's going to be sad to see him go until they see what Bill de Blasio is like. And uh, <laughs> at least if you live in New York City. Yearning for the good old days of free thinking, <laughs> easygoing Mike Bloomberg. <laughs> yes. On to most underrated now. And uh, I believe I had him as rising star last year. And that's Utah Senator Mike Lee. What you thought of the uh, strategy about defunding Obamacare. Some people liked it a lot. A lot of people didn't like it a lot. It was actually his idea, even though Ted Cruz was kind of the, the spokesman for that and did the filibuster and became the face of that effort. And 
I was in, in favor of it up to a point. I think once the Obamacare rollout was a disaster, they should have focused on that. But now Mike Lee is not just uh, going on that. He is laying out point by point a very detailed conservative reform agenda from tax reform, education reform, child care reform. It's a real smart look at, at how to go about some of these key issues that haven't been addressed in a long time. And he does things, whether you like him or not, in a very understated way. He's not uh, a guy that shouts at all or or seeks a lot of the limelight, but he's definitely a leader in, in some of the things we're seeing coming out of the Tea Party types. Greg, that is a very solid choice. We can put that into my dang it, why didn't I think of that one uh, <laughs> selection. I, I do like mine. Um, I, I Like with this one, I, I had a, a runner-up or a near-close. Cause I actually was thinking, believe it or not, John Kerry is perhaps one of the most underrated figures, not because I like him, even though the Kerry spot was very good for my career, (laughs) not because I like what he's doing as Secretary of State. But I think you look at his deals on Syria and how he blundered into the agreement that uh, Vladimir Putin seized and, and, and caused, the deal with Iran. I think these are terrible deals. But having said that, his style of big risk diplomacy is playing a defining role in Obama's second term. Uh, for some folks who might have thought, eh, you know, this is Kerry taking a, a one final lap as Secretary of State before retirement. No, no, no. He is the Brett Favre of diplomatic <laughs> agreements. He is, he is hurling, you know, them down the field. We'll see if they end up getting intercepted. Um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, he's a bigger factor than we might have. But since I, no one really likes the idea of celebrating John Kerry, uh, I'm going to go actually with a very different choice. I think it's a very, uh, very solid choice, which is South Carolina Republican Congressman Mark Sanford. Hmm. who everybody had given up for dead uh, after his scandal and uh, thought he was kind of ridiculous when he launched his comeback bid earlier in the year. Uh, He won three elections this year. He won the first primary, and then he won the runoff, and then he won the general election by a healthy nine points against Elizabeth Colbert Bush. Uh, Democrats ended up wasting a couple million dollars on the special house election, and he's kept himself out of trouble since. So worth noting in terms of how he got these wins, basically he went out and earned it. He was doing 10, 11 events a day, basically going up to an event and talking to anybody who wanted to ask him anything. He did interview, several interviews with me. He did interviews with you know big outlets, small outlets. Uh, and people wanted to ask him about his affair and, and the embarrassment of hiking the Appalachian Trail. He, he talked about it with everybody until people got tired of it and sick of it. And then he was able to shift to the issues. So, but, you know, meanwhile, Colbert Bush is sticking to you know very high, highly scripted, uh, uh, very restricted events and, and not being very specific on the issues. And Ultimately, he was a better fit for that district than, than Colbert Bush was. So I kind of think that you know, a lot of people kind of dismissed him, and I think he pro- he's able to enjoy what seems to be a thriving House career so far and enjoying a comeback. And uh, hopefully he'll you know, close out his career, remembered as a, uh, as a good congressman, not for this very embarrassing scandal of a few years ago. I have to agree with a lot of that. I know you and I had a debate about uh, whether he was the, the best choice for Republican voters before it got to the, the, the runoff against Colbert Bush, but he did earn it, absolutely. With uh, Yeah, and, and by the way, as we are saying this, it is entirely possible that by the time people hear this, he'll have gotten himself into another scandal. <laughs> um, so if that happens, forget everything I said and go back to John Kerry. That's <laughs> On to most honest politician. This is always the the shortest list to choose from uh, (laughs) each year, and and you kind of think around. There there may be some that I'm not thinking of, but the one I'm going to go with this year is Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. He's he's quite blunt. Uh, He's the one who uh, launched the first real filibuster in many, many years in the drones on the Senate floor. Uh, He has come out with a relatively detailed recovery plan for Detroit with great free market principles. And he's also been very active, and I think this is probably the most honest part of what he's done this year in talking about the need to reach out to demographics, particularly minorities and young people who do not tend to vote in a conservative fashion. He has gone to places like Howard University, which is a black university in Washington, and other forums where most of the people there aren't in agreement with much of what he believes, but he's willing to go there, share the conservative ideology, try to engage in meaningful conversations, and explain to people that Republicans and conservatives aren't these... uh, heartless, pasty, white, rich people, but people who just believe that free markets and and giving people the chance to make their own decisions in life is the best way to go for a society. A very solid choice. I'm going to go with kind of a a bigger one, and it's probably going to be less popular than your selection. (laughs) One of the big defining fights amongst conservatives, amongst folks on the right this year, came from the government shutdown. And I think that the skeptics of the shutdown have been proven largely correct that it was not an effective way to galvanize opposition to Obamacare. They were not correct in their assessment of the long-term damage to the party. But the shutdown really, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that it did obscure the problems with Obamacare. And for a couple of those first couple of weeks after Obamacare launched, 
the the dominant you know media coverage and discussion in the public was about the shutdown uh, instead of you know the policy implications, the cancellations, the website not working, and things like that. So I think we have to be honest with ourselves about what public opinion is and have a realistic sense of our ability to move it in a short period of time. And I think that one of the lessons of this year for the folks on the right is that once you shut down the government over an issue, the government shutdown becomes the issue. It overtakes the message you want to send through the negotiating tactic that has led to a government shutdown. So I think that, you know, that, that it's safe to say that this was saying, telling people things they didn't want to hear. It is not the way we'd like things to be. But if you're going to be a conservative, you've got to deal with the world as it is, not as you want it to be. So uh, shutdown skeptics, uh, unfortunately, were the most honest figures of 2013. One more final kind of note there is that when we were having this argument, people said, oh, you know, look, because of the shutdown, the media is discussing the shutdown. We want the media discussing the problems with Obamacare. Perpetuating the shutdown is, is providing a distraction. And, and the shutdown supporters were saying, no, no, no. The media is never going to cover the problems with Obamacare. The media is always going to cover it for the Obama administration. Well, I think we can safely say, looking at the coverage from about mid-October to today, the media coverage of the Obamacare rollout has been pretty brutal. And I don't think you can say the media has obscured it or covered it. I mean, there are certain pundits who continue to spout happy talk and things like that. But most people have been very clear. The website's not working. People are losing their insurance. The new selections are more expensive. The premiums are higher. The deductibles are higher. The copay, you know, like, like most people know, Obamacare is a big stinking mess. And for all of our usually extremely legitimate complaints about liberal media bias, most news organizations stepped up here and covered it as they saw it. You know, and it may just be the problem was just so darn big that there was no spinning it. There was no way to say, oh, this is – as the first couple of weeks, the president kept insisting these were just glitches. And it wasn't just you know website glitches because, oh, it was so popular and traffic was so great and stuff. So we can argue whether it really you – know, here we are at the end of December and we are, maybe it didn't make that much of a big difference. You know, the bad coverage of Obam Obamacare started mid-October instead of, say, October 2nd or 3rd. Um, but I still think it was a case of which you know, the, the ultimate spark of that problem was conservatives not being honest with themselves about what public opinion was. A public was very wary about Obamacare at that point, but they were not willing to support a government shutdown in order to get rid of it. Um, and I still don't think necessarily that the public will ever be a fan of government shutdowns. So thankfully, it looks like we're not going to see another one. And uh, hopefully we can make 2014 all about Obamacare. Use that to fuel big Republican wins in the midterms and start 2015 with a very different political environment in Washington, one that is much more amenable to full repeal. Jim, very good. Very good selection. That was certainly the dominant uh, political story of the year, at least one of the major dominant political stories. So we'll be back, <laughs> we'll be back on the 26th with our next uh, edition of our special year-end awards. So please join us then. And again, have a very Merry Christmas uh, from both of us here at the Three Martini Lodge.